Benin, West Africa. Mm -hmm. I, I am a research director at African Rebirth, and today I'm going to be, um, you know, uh, I, I, I will be the moderator of this uh, webinar. Okay, so um, let's start presenting our distinguished guests. Okay, so uh, let's start with the ambassador, Ambassador Frederica Gatrese Goga. Um, is the focal points of uh, for partnership the African Union border program and regional security mechanism in the office of the Commissioner for Political Affairs and Peace and Security of the African Union Commission. He served previously under the old African Union Commission structure as the head of the Conflict Prevention and Early Warning Division of the African Union Commission. Prior to joining the division, he served as a senior officer of the African Union mission in Somalia, Amisom, where he assisted operational teams from the military and civilians and police companies to provide support on counterterrorism and in the planning of military operations in, the, in line with Amisom's mandates. Ambassador Ngoga holds a master in public administration he also received numerous professional trainings on peacekeeping and international security with the African Center for uh, Research and Study on Terrorism in Algeria and uh, with the British Army Defense Intelligence and Security Center in uh, Chicksands, United Kingdom. He also received training uh, in the Defense Against Terrorism from NATO and Climate Change Sensitive Programming for Sustaining Peace from the United Nations. He is also a board member of the United Nations Development Program, preventing and responding to violence extremism in Africa projects. He was conferred on 16 April 2014, the rank of ambassador extraordinary and plenipotentiary of the Republic of Burundi. So uh, let's move on to our second distinguished guest, Kemal Abdella. He is the founder and president of Youth organization, OES Global Foundation Chief Executive Officer of Alma Team Trade Consultancy and Project Manager of Kush Bank under formation. He was lecturer at Sakon Nakon Rajat Hat University and Assistant Consul of the Ethiopian Consulate in Bangkok, Thailand's Editorial Secretary at PSAKU International Journal Interdisciplinary a literature reviewer at SNRU Journal of Science and Technology. He has been conducting, preventing, presenting and uh, publishing papers on research articles in education, entrepreneurship, leadership, and policy in Thailand, Vietnam, and China. He has been delivering and organizing several national and international training workshops and uh, conferences in Thailand, Indonesia, Dubai, Vietnam, Ethiopia, for various educational as well as financial institutions. Kemal is result-oriented, extremely motivated, professional and diligent young lecturer, leader, researcher with over 10 years experience in teaching leadership, research and community service in the country and abroad. He is committed to cons constantly develop his skills and grow professionally and uh, confidence in his ability to come up with interesting ideas and share with other, particularly youth, to bring a change in any organization campaign at all level in all time. So I, I welcome our distinguished guests. And uh, our today's topic is about the role of young people as drivers of strategic leadership and governments in Africa. So let me give the floor to our presidents and founder, Enoch. Thank you. Thank you, Osman. Uh, it's a pleasure to see everyone and uh, my warmest welcome to Ambassador Fred Ngoga. Good to see you. And uh, Kamal, Mr. Kamal. Uh, so I am not an expert either in uh, governance or leadership. We have fully experts here. And I want to thank Dawit uh, for connecting us with uh, Ambassador Nuga, both work at the African Union. So let's dive into today's topic. The, the, the topic is the, the strategic, uh, the key role of 
young people, as drivers of really uh, strategic leadership and uh, peace. Is uh, Mr. Kamal in here? Um, is he is he in the is he in the room? He he, he is in the room. He joined already. Uh, yeah, he's, he's here. here. Uh, well, yeah, yeah, he's here. Oh, okay. Uh, do you put your video, sir, uh, Mr. Kamal? Okay, so good. Now I can see you. So uh, today, um, Mr. Kamal is a young leader, younger, you know, young activist. Um, then blends so well as the role of really young people taking up. And now we bring in the extinguished uh, experience of Ambassador Freight, uh, you know, to really examine the role of young people. People call themselves young, but they're not really young. Young people are the ones who are still breastfeeding. We are destined to do great these things. So uh, the role of young people as in the strategy of leadership and uh, and uh, governance. So I will start by just, uh, you know, to make our audience really understand what is the difference between strategic leadership and uh, a, a, the strategic the leadership and governance. What is the difference? How, do you, how can you define strategic uh, leadership and strategic governance? And I will start with Ambassador Fred. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you so much for inviting me. And uh, the moment I saw the invitation, I, I said that I wanted to participate because this is a topic that is really close to my heart. Uh, first and foremost, because I may be biologically old, but I think I, ideologically I'm still young. Uh, <laughs> and, and, and even that, I, I'm not so sure. But really, what is strategic leadership? For me, strategic leadership is first and foremost strategic thinking. And when I say strategic thinking is to have foresight so that you can look, the ability to look ahead, to have hindsight, the ability to look back, and to have peripheral sight, the ability to look around you and what's happening around you, and to have also peripheral sight, which is the ability, uh, you know, to shape the future uh, and so that, you, you know, you can survive it. So first and foremost, it's your your ability to really to focus on what's important. Uh, it's about making the choices about the things that really will matter in the future and also to uh, study how to mobilize others so that you can, you can tackle it. I'll give you just a simple example. We have many crises on the African continent and many of them require us to attend to them, but not all of them are as strategic in importance as, as some others. For example, the Libya crisis is strategic for us because the crisis in Libya has had a spillover into what has happened in the Sahel for afterwards. The yeah. Sahel is very strategic for us because it's a, it's a big space yeah. and we have to tackle the issues there. You have the issues in the Horn. The Horn also where everything, uh, when one country get a cold, the others cough. And you have also the Great Lakes region where what happens in the Democratic Republic of Congo, for example, affects at least nine of its neighbors. So in, in other words, strategic leadership is, is really the ability to think strategically, the ability to really anticipate some of the major challenges that are there, the okay. ability to bring people to work together to address them, and the ability also to find entry points that allows you to tackle them. Uh, everybody thinks they're strategic, but, not every, but most of the time people are tactical. And mm -hmm. we, we, we need to distinguish uh, what is, you know, having strategic thinking and being and having tactical thinking so that's what i can say about um about about strategic uh, leadership uh, it's really about tackling those things that are important let me conclude here by saying one thing which is important i think today we have a an agenda and uh, david uh, knows about this because it was discussed uh, during the summit where the four key five key agenda items that are continental in nature one the first agenda is how do we create states that are responsive to the needs of their citizens? I've, we've been talking about our constitution changes of government. You know you have a problem when you have opposition parties, when you have the clergy, church leaders, when you have uh, trade unions demonstrating and welcoming a coup d'etat. So that in itself, it means that an election is no longer enough. What our number one challenge for this generation is the ability to, have, to build governments that are responsive and that could really uh, address the needs of their people. Two, 
is the agenda of creating prosperity. I think people can are no longer uh, happy to hear that their governments have had loans from the IMF, World Bank, or so on, when it doesn't affect them and it doesn't change their daily lives. Three, it's the ability to tackle peace and security challenges that we're faced with. Right now, we're dealing with terrorism, we're dealing with uh, violent extremism, we're dealing with uh, changing threats actually on the continent, now cyber attacks and so on and so forth. So all these things, we need to really be uh, tactical in terms of how uh, we tackle them. These, and it starts with governance, because all of these things, they find their, their, you know, their, their problems within governance. The third issue, which I think is a, is a, is a important and of continental agenda, is how is Africa faring in this bipolar world? Right now, you're seeing the competition between superpowers, and most of it is played out on our own continent. So we have to be uh, smart in terms of how we deal with this. Fourth, it's uh, the pandemics. The, the COVID-19 pandemic has truly shown us how vulnerable we are uh, and, and the, the importance of investing in research uh, and the importance of, of, of uh, investing in our health infrastructure. Last but not least, I think, just finish uh, the AU summit, there will be, Turk there was just a Turkish uh, summit. Th then we're gonna have TCAD, which is Um, you are experiencing some kind of okay. Uh, your, your voice is breaking. It's very breaking. Okay, we'll come back to him to him when uh, I think internet is still disturbing a bit. Uh, but come, Mr. Kamal, I want to bring you in this input and. Uh, Fred has really explained what strategic leadership means. Scanning things around you, looking into the future, you know, by being having a tactical hand uh, solving. So, what's your, what is strategic leadership to you, Mr. Kamal? Uh, thank you so much, all, uh, for having me today, and uh, I really appreciate uh, the initiative. And uh, I'm very happy and honored to be. Uh, uh, to, to talk about uh, leadership, uh, particularly about uh, strategic leadership. And uh, I'm very happy to, to, to know uh, Ambassador and uh, share his experience as well, because uh, as uh, a young uh, leader, I need to share experience from our uh, uh, ambassadors and experienced people. So uh, allow me to share my PowerPoint so that I can uh, 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 share my my views and the ideas on the topics. Uh, I request people to mute if you're not speaking, uh, so that we don't interrupt. Yeah. Oh, so you want to share? You can share. Yes, if you allow me, I want to share. Yeah. Okay. Uh, I hope my slide is uh, clear, right? We can't see it yet. It's not visible. And, and by not... the way, let me tell the audience that if you have questions, please don't forget to drop them to the chats so that after the presentation, we, we will try to answer them. Yeah, it's not visible from my side as well. Yeah, it's not visible. Okay. Um, yes. That's why you are talking. Oh, oh uh, Mr. Kamal, would you send it uh, and I, I can share it? So when they will. Uh, you can't send me, then I can't share it. Yeah, it's shared. Okay. Yeah, now it's fine. We can see it. Okay. Thank you so much. Uh, before I uh, discuss about or say something about strategic leadership, I really want to uh, say something about the challenges of leadership in Africa. 
as you all know, uh, there are a lot of uh, challenges that our continent is uh, facing regarding uh, leadership. One of these is uh, nepotism, and uh, nepotism is one of the leadership challenges that Africa has been uh, facing. The price of uh, uh, nepotism causes a complete failure of uh, a country and also organization uh, to develop, uh, not only in, uh, in, in, in our country and even in other country, continents. We are, they, they are also facing this uh, kind of challenges. And also uh, the challenge is a competition of, uh, for power and uh, preeminence. And soon after attaining independence, after African freedom fighters and leaders uh, rapidly embarked on personal struggles to be the first among equals. So this is also one of the challenges that uh, uh, we in Africa are facing. And uh, one of the, uh, the, the mother of challenges uh, is also corruption. As you all know, so corruption is a big problem for uh, our continents. And it is uh, uh, taking back us to uh, 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 back in, in every, I can say in every sectors, including uh, uh, economic uh, development. And the, the other one is a failure to uh, redefine goals in the- We can't, we can't, we can't see, uh, sorry to interrupt. We can see the PowerPoint, but we don't see the slide. Which slide are you on, um, specific slide? Um, you can't see this one? We can see like the whole PowerPoint, but we can't see very well the slide you are on. Yeah, the slider on the side, actually. Yeah. Okay, okay, let me explain, okay? I will, I will show you my uh, slide now. later, okay? Okay, okay, good. Mm. Okay, so uh, the other challenge of uh, leadership in Africa is failure to redefine goals. In, uh, the constantly uh, dynamic world of politics challenges continue to evolve uh, regarding the failure to uh, redefine goals. And also at the, uh, at the African levels, we have a blurred vision uh, that our leaders uh, uh, really uh, seems like they don't have or uh, they don't uh, really see uh, the, the, the vision or the, the aim that they have in the future and long term. So they have a blurred vision. And also uh, dictatorship is also one of uh, the challenges uh, that we are facing here. And the real problem uh, is posed by the, those leaders who will lapse into uh, dictatorial uh, tendencies either because their uh, uh, countrymen trust uh, them too much or uh, too little. So as Africans, uh, we really need uh, effective uh, strategic uh, leadership. Uh, so uh, I'm coming to the definition or uh, the meaning of strategic leadership. Uh, before that, I really want to uh, like uh, say something about uh, leadership itself. As you all know that leadership has nothing to do with uh, seniority or one's position in hierarchy, titles, personal, uh, personality attributes. And uh, so leadership is a process of social influences which maximize the effort of uh, others uh, towards the achievements of uh, the, the goal. So this is... Uh, one of the definitions or the main definition of uh, leadership. Uh, from this uh, definition, we have some key elements that can help us to uh, determine or uh, judge what kind of uh, leadership uh, is in, 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 in Africa. So the key element of uh, this definition is uh, that and that implies they don't need to be uh, direct uh, reports, uh, no mention of uh, personality traits, attributes, or even a title. Uh, there are many styles, many paths to uh, effective leadership. And this uh, definition also includes a goal uh, uh, not to influence with no intended outcome. So uh, when we discuss about the challenges in uh, in, 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 in the previous uh, slides, uh, 
uh, we or the, our our leaders uh, they have a very blurred vision even it seems that they don't have goals when they they do uh, corruption in in, in their uh, community or society as the people or the community is not also is not really theirs okay so uh, leadership uh, mean uh, this uh, to me and when i come to strategic leadership strategic leadership is the ability to influence uh, others to voluntarily take decisions that enhance the prospects for the organizations and long-term success while maintain, maintaining short-term financial stability. A strategic leadership is also a, a leader's ability to visualize, plan, lead, and make the best out of the resources they have to execute strategic effectively and successfully. And uh, the strategic leaders uh, marry their uh, strategic plan to their strategic uh, management, strategic uh, uh, leadership. So their organization respects their uh, leadership role and overall vision while working to bring that vision to life. And uh, uh, productive and uh, management mindset play my major roles uh, and uh, how leaders think equals how they lead. And a strategic mindset reflects something I can, sorry, I, I can, a strategic, sorry, uh, is a call, a strategic agility, agility and the ability to see how the big picture uh, relates to uh, here and uh, now. So this is uh, all about the definition or the concept of strategic uh, leadership. For me, uh, uh, there are about uh, 10 uh, skills that, uh, strategic leaders must have one of them is the strategic thinking and the strategic communication skills strategic planning measuring objectives and the key results strategic agility uh, awareness and trust reliability uh, and the integrity as well as management Oh, we lost you, sir. You there? Hello? I think the network has been breaking and he is no longer there. But uh, we, we can see his slides. Um, okay. Yeah, he's just hanging. The slide is hanging here. Oh, okay. Okay. So the slide's gone. So he was presenting really pretty stuff. Uh, but network is, uh, you know, uh, really not provided. And we'll go ahead. So he was talking about strategic uh, leadership and demonstrating how a leader, you don't have to have a position to be called a leader. Oh, you're here. Kamel, are you back? Hey, there is, I mean, network problem here in Ethiopia, always the same, oh, so uh, no risk for that. So we can oh. continue with Ambassador Fred. Okay, he'll come back, we'll continue. So Ambassador Fred, you are finishing a strong point. Do you repeat what you're saying and finish your point you're making? Well, last point I was making was about uh, basically the need for us to, that everybody has a strategy for Africa and that there is a need for Africa to have a strategy for other parts of the world. Uh, the EU has a strategy for Africa, but we African have a strategy for the EU. I don't know if you can hear me. Uh, Hello, Sion, would you... Hello, Sion. Do you mute? Please. Yeah. Ambassador, you can continue. We, we're listening sure. to you. Thank you so much. So I was saying, I was talking about the need for Africa to develop also its own strategy. I was listening to the presentation uh, of the gentleman who was making uh, the presentation about what strategic leadership is all about. You know, at the end of the day, I think sometimes we need to keep things simple. At the end of the day, what people want is they want someone who can uh, provide them security, 
someone who can provide them health care, someone who can provide them uh, a chance to grow, uh, someone who can actually uh, project them into the future, and someone who can bring them along. It's as simple as that. And I think that one of the, the number one challenges and what we have failed to do of late and why we have so many problems of governance is that we, we have taken it here and instead of making it really about the people. A friend of mine who I like very much once said that everything that we do is to uh, allow us to live long and to live well. And, and I think that this is something that we should not uh, forget. I would like to also quote uh, pre former President Jerry John Rawlings. I, I once worked with him and he said something which has stayed with me. He said, we often get lost in the games of politics and often forget that, that our North Star should be our principles, values, and kindness to our fellow mankind. So sometimes let's not too much intellectualize things, but really bring it down to the basics, the basics about delivering for our people and addressing their needs, because this is ultimately the challenge of this generation and your challenge. Let me also conclude by saying something. Now I'm talking to young people here. The frustration, and I consider myself young as well, the frustrations that we are faced with is, uh, you know, has to do with the fact that those of us who should be running for office are not running for office. And what has happened is that we have left the space for those who have no business whatsoever running for office to run for office. And then we get frustrated. I would like to challenge each and every one of you here. If you want an Africa that is growing, an Africa that is prosperous, an Africa where human dignity is respected, run for office. It doesn't matter whether you're a councilman or it doesn't matter whether you are an, a parliamentarian, but get involved, run for office. And by the way, we need uh, leaders in, in the political sphere, but we also need leaders in the business sphere. We need leaders in healthcare. Whatever you do, you know, get involved and run. For us to be thinking constantly all the time, I can assure you, in 20, your children, in about a few years' time, they'll be telling you how frustrated they are with you. Uh, I, so that's what I'm saying to you, get involved and run. Absolutely, I couldn't agree more uh, than that. Because if you, you see the trend, um, you know, we, we blame those in power right now. But what you find that even those in power right now, they blame those they found in power right now. So it keeps on rotating. They are corrupt. They are not good. That so the, the thing is in, in inclusive. Like let's really lower down the the definitions and really service to people. And that's why I, I like the idea that let's go in, let's get involved in. And that comes to the, my second point about governance now. What what is governance in relation to the 21st century. How should governance be uh, looked at? How should it be governed? How should it be, how should it be understood and practiced? You wanna go ahead, Ambassador Fred? When, when I was preparing for this, uh, for this meeting, I, I kind of uh, looked into my notes and the things that I've seen uh, you know, in my, my daily work over the years. There are eight indicators of governance, and I'm going to try to say them slowly. The number one, I think, is responsiveness. And I think I've been highlighting this. Uh, you, you may be in office, but if you're not able to uh, uh, tackle the needs of people, then uh, you know, that's a challenge. The second one is the rule of law. You know, we need, a, 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 we need uh, systems whereby you know that if you're wrong, that you can go to the courts and that they can really uh, redress uh, and address your, your concerns. The third one is consensus oriented. You have to always build consensus around you and to be able to carry people around you because you not building consensus, you know, it, it becomes a one person show and doesn't serve us well. The fourth one is transparency. Transparency, people like people who are transparent in how they do uh, their business. We wanna know, you, you know, that you're not taking us for a ride. We want, we want transparency. The fourth one, and this one is, I think, the number one challenging one in, in many of our countries, is equity and inclusiveness. Equity and inclusiveness, I think, is uh, well, a challenge because you see, uh, some, when people are in power, they think they're being inclusive. But really, you know, we have been struggling in many of our countries to measure inclusiveness. And I think this is a challenge. And when I say inclusiveness, I'm, I'm talking about uh, 
making sure that in your systems of governance, you have women, you have uh, the elderly, you have the young, you have all ethnic groups, you have all religious, you know, that everybody is, is, is uh, represented. And I think Africa, we struggle a lot with this um, and because we have no measurements of how to measure inclusiveness. The fifth one, I think is effectiveness. Effectiveness, because you know, not everybody is, is effective or efficient in whatever they do. Uh, and I think that just because you have an idea, it doesn't mean that you can deliver. Look at how many countries have uh, responded to the pandemic. Those who have failed well are those who have systems of governments that work. The left hand knows what the right hand is doing. So effectiveness and efficiency is also extremely important as it pertains to governance. Last but not least, we cannot talk about governance without talking about accountability. People being held accountable for what they do and us actually being having the ability to hold accountable our leaders for what they do. I often remind people that our leaders are actually uh, at the service of us because their salaries are paid with that by our taxpayers, you know, and it's called public service for a reason, it's public service. So those are some of the things that I can say about what governance is all about. But then again, let me come back again to the simple, most basic things, which is really to address the needs of the people. Uh, yesterday, uh, I was on the phone with uh, someone from my home country, Burundi, and the person was telling me, oh, you know, there's a, there's a, a problem of liquidity in the country, people are poor, um, and then he says, I wish that, you know, we could have a system whereby we can borrow money for the, the weekend and then uh, tackle some of these issues. Uh, you know, that's responsiveness. So basically identify the real issues of people and how we can actually tackle them. That is the number one key uh, challenge that we have. Thank you so much. Oh, very good. Um, again, you put it very correct. You know, I like the point of accountability. You know, uh, people think when sometimes when they think when their offices they are untouchable, they become semi goats So they do whatever they want. And real accountability is the key player that has been really missing. The key thing been missing in African politics and government. So thank you so much, uh, Mr. Kamal. You. Hope you're back. You're back? Do you hear us? He is back. There would, would you check on him whether he's back? Exactly. He's, no. he's with us. So are you there? You... Okay. Do you mute, please, if you're not speaking? Uh, I think he's having a network issue. We'll, we'll go ahead. When he comes back, we'll, you know, we'll give him audience to speak. And then comes that uh, to the role of young people now. That we are divided, you know, built define leadership very well, excellent. We define governance, the four parameters of governance. How now, what is the key role of young people in cementing and really going forward with the leadership. How can we young people contribute in a leadership terms, but also in governance? And you talk about, since you have a background in security and defense mechanism, what is the key role of young people in peace building? Mm -hmm. you, you muted. Is the question for me? Yes, it is for you. Oh, thank you so much. Oh, uh, um, first of all, I'm excited because within the AU, we, we recently launched the Youth for Peace program, and uh, I was uh, part one of the architects of it. Uh, let's begin with uh, conflict prevention. I think that the number one role that young people can play is really to be uh, peacemakers wherever they are and to prevent uh, violent conflicts. And that starts with recognizing other people's humanity. Uh, everywhere where you are, when you when you see other people being discriminated against because of their race, gender, or, or, or religion, you know, and to be able to speak up and to be able to be agents of peace. So to contribute to conflict prevention. Many countries have elections which are coming up. Well, I've seen some very good practices where young people will set up, for example, situation rooms and to identify uh, uh, to identify like potential hotspots uh, in a particular uh, a country when before the elections. So get involved in conflict prevention initiatives, work with your governments where you can, you can work with them. And then the second part is issues related to mediation. Where there is a crisis, 
uh, get involved in mediation processes. We have many conflicts uh, revolving around land issues, uh, you know, climate change and, and, and so on and so forth. The third aspect where I think the young people can, where they can play a role is to actually participate in what we call uh, stabilization, stabilization initiatives. Uh, you know, countries that have been through conflicts, uh, they're always fragile and always vulnerable. And they often need uh, young people to get involved in, in trying to consolidate the gains that have been achieved over the years. Uh, they say that a country that's been in conflict actually goes back into conflict after five years. So we need to have young people getting also involved in this. And then last but not least is young people getting involved also to make sure that they are at the table. They are at the table because it's important. Uh, for example, in the African Union right now, we are trying to make sure that every delegation that goes into mediation, that we have uh, young people represented. That's why we have youth ambassadors, if you've heard about them. Uh, but let me tell you something. Uh, you, you will not be called to sit at the table. You will have to fight for it and you will have to make sure that, uh, that, that you're there. Uh, otherwise, if you go there in the corner and, and sit and think that uh, they, will, they will allow you to, to be at the table, you're mistaken. Uh, interestingly enough, uh, you, know, you also have people who are biologically quite old, but who are ideologically young, so they want to be there. So, um, and they yeah. don't want to let go. I just want to give you a, a, a story um, that, that uh, it's, it's a story that I like to mention. When I was six years old, um, I once welcomed a president. You know those children who have flowers, who, who give flowers to presidents who are coming into their country. Mm -hmm. I once uh, welcomed the uh, head of state, um, and, and this head of state uh, is still in office today. Uh, and that's 40 something years later. Um, <laughs> The point I'm trying, I, I didn't mention who it is, but I, we but, can't but guess. I, I remember. <laughs> we can't guess. <laughs> <laughs> you, can, you, can, you, you can guess. But what I'm trying to say is, yeah. you know, uh, unless unless you, you fight for you to be there, uh, you will not be uh, invited to, to the table. And which brings me to my last point and the one that I started with early on. Run for office. Don't be shy about it. Run for office. Get, you know, in fact, I would like to even challenge some of the young people who are here on this call that if we can have about a group of about a young, 100 young people you know, to run in their respective countries, whatever elected office, offices that they're running to, we can begin to make a difference because we bring these ideas that we share, this younger generation share, uh, ideas of people who are free from bigotry, free from discrimination. Yeah. You know, if we create a mass movement of young people running for office, it will really make a difference because ultimately, I, I hear people discriminate, uh, you know, talking about the African Union, saying, "Oh, the African Union is not this. The African Union is not, it's not that." The mm -hmm. truth is, the African Union is a member state organization, and he who says member state organization, we're talking about the heads of state, those who are in power in our respective countries, mm -hmm. and we can only be as good as they want us to be good. So, if you want to see change, run at the national and local levels. Absolutely, absolutely, absolutely. So. Involvement. What I hear from your tone is getting involved. You know, don't wait. I like the point that no one will come, will come here at the table, because even those in power have their own kids and their uncles to some. So you, you really have to fight your well. I think that is a frank and honest opinion. Because leaders will tell you, "Oh no, come to power." You know, you think that they won't tell you that they also want the table. You know, so let's go to the table by ourselves. So, Mr. Kamal, I would like to uh, bring you into it here. I, I hope you are in now. The, the we told me you're in. Um, are you there? Uh, okay. So, internet is really betraying our panels to hear the brave ideas. But the last question, and this is we'll let it go to, uh, after this, we'll have the audience ask. You know, leadership in the 20th century, 18th century, is so different from the 21st century. So how can young people, what key leadership traits can really young people cling on or develop to fit the century we are in? Um. Uh, I, I would, uh, you know, I was, uh, I will show you something. Uh, the first thing I think about when I talk about young people and leadership, I look at my phone. And right now, leadership is, is the experience life because it's about Twitter. It's about, uh, you know, communication and social media and so on. 
And you will be so uh, surprised how, you know, the information is widely available. Uh, there are, you know, many, many, uh, how do you say this? Uh, you have many people looking at uh, what, what is happening live. So people can no longer hide uh, like they used to, to hide. So leadership in the 21st century is being, uh, it, it's being done, you know, lively, live, you know, and people can hold to you, can hold you account to account, um, you know, in a matter of seconds or, or, or minutes. So we must up the game. I think that uh, our uh, parents did a good job, you know, during the, those circumstances, but we also need to adjust to the issues of the moment and that we're dealing with. Um, we need to project ourselves, uh, you know, in, in terms of in the future and look at, okay, where do we see ourselves in the, in the, in the, in the near future? And then adjust our leadership styles in terms of how we campaign. I, you know what, one thing that saddens me the most, when you go on social media, and I'm talking about social media because that's where it's happening, most of it, mm -hmm. the, the hatred that, and, the, and the, you know, the aggressiveness of young people nowadays on social media is quite troubling. And you will find that they, will, they have carried with them the, uh, the prejudices that their parents had. And, 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 I've, and, it's, and it's, 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 it's concerning to me because you would think that, you know, the younger generation, which has been much more exposed, went to school, has been educated, that they're free from tribalism and all these things. But it's very, very, very much there. And it doesn't matter which country, many countries are actually faced uh, with this problem. And I think the number one thing that we need to do, uh, uh, you know, to showcase leadership in the 21st century is to fight what I call tribalism. The hatred for your fellow mankind, the hatred for your fellow African, um, you know, we need to fight that. And I think, uh, you know, to, to focus on our common humanity. And once you do that, then you can now tackle all the other challenges. Um, you know, when you when you when you see, for example, Africans trading jabs on 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 the internet, it, it saddens me because you know one of the thing of colonialism that has done to us is that it has taught us to self hate, to hate ourselves, and and so. When you're busy hating yourself, you're not busy focusing on developing yourself. So re let's recognize our common humanity and, and we, we direct our energy into uh, building uh, a prosperous Africa. And I think that's what we should be focusing on. That's what leadership will be all about. Last but not least, uh, I'm passionate about this, so I have so much again to say. Last but not least is, you know, we as Africans don't make sense in fragmentation. We make sense in unity. We are the richest continent in the world, and we are the poorest, richest continent in the world. How do you explain that? It doesn't make sense. We, and I repeat, we are the richest continent in the world, but we're also the poorest, richest continent in the world. It's because we have everything to succeed, but unless we're united and we stop the fragmentation, and what, uh, uh, you, you know, the president, former president of Senegal, uh, Abdullah uh, Diop, uh, not Abdullah Diop, um, Abdullah Wad used to call uh, the competition of winners, where we, we are competing against each other in things that don't, don't make any sense. Ruin is competition. Uh, mm -hmm. We will not move forward. So I think those are the challenges that, that the future leaders of the 21st century will have to look into. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Ambassador Frey. Um, and and as African rebirth, we defined really that the way forward for Africa is unity. And unity on interest that to really improve our lives and our people's lives. So. Uh, digital communication, learning how to communicate, you know, embracing each other. I like the way you mentioned, like you, when you see social media people, most people who are on these social media, you know, extending generational hate uh, for each other. It's really saddening. And uh, young people should really avoid that. And not only young people, even old people should stop their long term hatred. So I will, uh, thank you so much. I will. Uh, allow the audience to ask their questions. I see the chat box is full. They have a lot of questions for you. And I really like to thank you, Ambassador Freight and Mr. Kamal, if you're in here, and then I'll hand it back to Osman to take it from now. Thank you. Yes, I would like to thank all the guests and I can't thank them enough. And you can't imagine what valuable information I've learned from the uh, this uh, presentation and uh, thank you so much and thank you for sharing those uh, valuable information with us. So um, we've got a couple of questions uh, uh, to ask. The first question uh, is about corruption. 
And uh, Al Hagi is saying that corruption is deeply rooted in almost all African countries, which makes it very difficult for continents for the continent to move. For instance, um, he or she is giving the example of Gambia, the Gambia. He said that the Gambia is a prominent C CSO in Gambia participate recently filling an anti corruption bill in the parliament, which is taking endless time to be considered. Then they applied for a permit for peaceful demonstration regarding the passage of the bill, but police vehemently denied this permit. How do we deal with this issue? And I'm gonna just uh, ask one more question. These, those two questions are actually really related to each other. Uh, during your presentation, Ambassador, you've given your criteria of what good governance is, right? So I, I would like to know if there is a country in the world, it, it doesn't necessarily have to be Africa, but in the world that's actually fulfilled those criteria that you mentioned when you were doing the presentation. And at the same time, how do we effectively deal with corruption? Because uh, Gambia, the Gambia example is a very, very actually um, real life example how people don't want to, you know, uh, let this problem go. Thank you so much. Uh, I think uh, the issue of corruption at this point has even become spiritual in some countries. I, I think in my view, corruption exists everywhere and it has existed so long as there are human beings, it exists. What has made a difference in some countries uh, more so than others is the price you pay for being corrupt. Uh, you can, re you know, you never root out corruption entirely, but you can reduce the levels of corruption that you have. But if, if, if people know that the price that you're going to pay is so high, then they will be less likely to get involved in corruption. And that is what has made a difference. And that's why I, I, I concluded when I was talking about my criteria about governance, I talked about accountability. Accountability, that's, that is the, the, the key word. I can assure you, there is a country that where I went and, I'm, and, and I saw police officers, um, you know, there were five or six of them. Among the five or six of them, one was to monitor the other police officers on how they were behaving. So it's all about the mechanisms that you put in place uh, really so that people know that, you know, the price is really high for being corrupt, uh, you know. But I've seen also in other countries uh, whereby people don't uh, send someone to jail, but they, they force them to reimburse the money that they have stolen. So there are different mechanisms and different ways of doing it. The key is to shrink the level of corruption as much as possible. But I would like to also warn you about something. The issue of corruption does exist in Europe, in the US, uh, in Asia, everywhere. But we should also be very careful as young Africans to not uh, perpetuate a narrative that wants us to keep us down. Every time that you talk about Africa, oh, corruption is the, the, the next word that comes to it. And let me tell you, it's done on purpose. It's done on purpose to prevent investment from coming to our countries. I'm not saying corruption does not exist. But I'm just saying that we should be careful not to perpetuate a certain narratives that keeps us down as a country. What we should be focusing on is how we can find innovative ideas uh, to actually uh, to avoid corruption. Uh, in my country, Burundi, for example, I know that the president is, has embarked on a, a process of digitalization because he realized that you know if you digitalize uh, your transaction, it's it's less likely. You know, you know, to money doesn't pass into hands, and you're less likely to be corrupt. So we have to come up with innovative ideas, but also, like I said, be careful not to be caught up into this narrative, whereby you know everything that is African is corrupt. So uh, I think this is going to be a, a fight that we're going to be fighting for a long time. Uh, in fact, so long as I was reading in books of history, even on the 17th century, um, corruption existed even during Jesus' time. Corruption existed in Jerusalem for those who have watched uh, uh, movies and so on and so forth. Absolutely. So this is something that will be with us, but we will need to just make sure that we have systems of, of accountability that are strong uh, and, and, and that the price that you pay for it is steep enough. Thank you. Very good. Thank, thank you for, for, for the answer. Now, the next question is saying, um, how can young people be effective now in what they do and avoid the dilemma or this dilemma of fighting against each other and work in collaboration to be trusted with leadership positions? So that's the question. Well, that's a very interesting question and I, and I, and I like it. You know, um, for, the, for those of you, I'm a student of history and I love history. Um, one of the 
best examples I can, you, we have somewhere to begin with and somewhere to, to learn. So first and foremost, everything starts with ideology. That's where you start, ideology. In the 1950s, a group of young Africans who didn't know each other, uh, one was called, led by Julius Nyerere of Tanzania. He connected, Julius Nyerere connected Patrice Lumumba of DR Congo with the Prince Luigo Gasore of Burundi. And they also connected with, uh, with uh, other leaders such as the Dahibwa of Rwanda and, uh, and others, and uh, the King of Uganda of that time. They were young, they were young Pan-Africanists who made it a point to get to know each other and to work together to fight for independence. And I can tell you that aside from Julius Nyerere, all the others were murdered. They started by killing uh, the King of Rwanda in 1959, Rudahigwa. Then they killed uh, Patrice Lumumba in 1960. And then the last one was Louis Bogasore, who was murdered. But what, they, what did these young leaders had in common? They, were, they had ideological uh, uh, clarity. They, they knew what they wanted. And so they went to build these alliances. For example, how many of you know, uh, you know, do you build networks to get to know each other with the young people from North Africa or West Africa or, or, or Southern Africa? How much do you know about each other? So I think that if we are going to pass on the second phase of liberation, which for me, I think is economic liberation, we need to build these alliances, get to know each other, identify those who are moving and shaping things, you know, become friends, uh, you know, support each other. If you hear uh, um, that Dawit is running for office in Ethiopia, you know, let's get together and try to see how we can uh, support him. If Ambassador Fred is running for office in Burundi, let's get together and see how we can support him, especially if ideologically we are aligned. And like I said, everything starts with ideology because that's where uh, I think we have, this generation of ours has, has had a challenge. Our forefathers who, who wanted to give us independence, they had ideological clarity. So what do we want us? Uh, at this generation or, or you know what do we want to see once you have that you build the networks that can propel you to your successes very good thank you so much for the explanation and the the other guest is not here kemal unfortunately so we'll have to continue with you ambassador hopefully you won't be tired with the questions so uh this guy i don't know his name but uh, here is the question uh you, he said that uh, you talked about the rule of law and uh, the question is, if there is no rule of law in a country, how, what do you do to make sure that uh, you, you actually become a country where the rule of law is applied in case there is no rule of law in a specific country, for example? What do you do to, uh, let's say, restore rule of law? Well, where there is no rule of law, it's the law of the jungle. And uh, you open up, uh, you know, um, you open up, uh, all sorts of uh, you know, adventures, but I don't know that any country that doesn't have laws that govern it. Mm -hmm. I think what, what we're talking about is, you know, beginning a dialogue on how is it that we can, you know, make sure that, you know, that, that we, we develop a culture where the law is, is, is respected. You know, we, as Africans, we usually we dialogue, but we no longer dialogue, uh, you know, or, or, or the spaces are not created for us to be able to dialogue. And I think that as young people, the number one thing that you need to do or get involved in is, you know, raise issues. You now we have social media. You know, uh, the other day I was looking. Uh, at, you know, there were some people who had who are abusing someone in my country, uh, in a, in, a, in a province which is in the southern part of the country. Then young people went to social media and raised the alarm, and immediately the police arrested these people. So, the rule of law is also you. You and, the, and, and now you have the tools which are at your disposal, at your fingertips, where you can call, uh, you know, you, you can, can seize your leaders on, online and say, hey, we're seeing a problem here. We need to, to do something about it. So it's about dialogue. It's about raising awareness about what the issues are. I'll tell you one thing. I, I don't know a single African who wakes up in the morning saying that he's going to mess up his, his or her country. I think people are caught up in operations and sometimes some issues are, are not brought to the fore. When I say operations, I'm talking about trying to put bread on the table uh, or, or trying to make a, a living. So rule of law, it really everything starts with us. Thank I you. understand that, yeah. Thank you so much, Ambassador. So the, the other question is, you mentioned something very important. You, talk, you talked about rolling for election or position in general, and Kemal is back. So maybe this question, can be directed to uh, Kemal, to Mr. Kela, maybe he, if uh, he can uh, answer the question. If he can't, then 
will have to move on with you. So it's saying, uh, the question is this, um, how do I know? Lerato is asking this question. How do I know if I'm fit to run for a position? How do I know that? So if, if Kemal... Uh, let's continue with Ambassador. Okay, Ambassador, uh, the question, did you understand the question, Ambassador? For, to run for office? Yes. The fact, that you're, the fact that you would even ask yourself that question is already problematic. Uh, <laughs> you, yeah, it, it's problematic because you have to have some level of confidence. Yeah. And if you're not confident in yourself, how are you going to get others to... To, to, to believe in you. I think everything, by the way, uh, leadership is not a science, it's an art. Some people uh, have a gift, a natural gift, uh, others don't. Um, and in fact, most of the time, it's when you have power that you, you can notice these type of things. So it is, uh, in, in, our, in, in fact, in our language, we call it Tingabirano, which is, it's a gift from God, really, uh, that, that you have. But I think that sometimes people also become accidental leaders because circumstances can create uh, situations whereby you, you have to lead, you know, you're brought to lead. I think each and every one of us has, has uh, skills that no one else has. Uh, but the most important thing is to know, uh, you know, trust, build trust in yourself. You know, the first leader you need to convince is yourself. Once you believe in yourself, then it becomes much easier. When I was um, 20 years old, I joined the political party in my country. And I, as you can imagine, when you're 20 years old, you have a lot of ideas. So one day I went into uh, an executive committee meeting of the political party and, uh, and they, they wanted to shut me down, but I said, I'm gonna speak. So I started outlining and for me, I believe in unity. Unity, I, don't, I, I dislike tribalism with a passion. So I started speaking and because of what I was saying made sense. And, it brought back the discussion to the most basic things, really. So what the point I'm trying to make here is very simple. Leadership starts with what you stand for. What is it that you stand for? Ask yourself, what is it that is important to you? And then go for it and fight for it. I understand that. Thank you, Ambassador. Uh, the next question is actually very simple and straightforward. Uh, you talked about good governments and some of the questions are all related to good government. The, the, uh, the person is asking, what do you think is the most important problem of good, good governments in Africa and how do we deal with it? Well, the issues of governance, by the way, it's not only an African problem, um, it's everywhere in, in the world. The only difference is uh, the capacity of our governments to attend to our needs, to our problems, our daily problems. Um, you, I think this is, the, this is the one thing that I think uh, we need to be paying attention to. And I said earlier in the beginning of our conversation that the number one challenge of this generation will be to build systems of governance that are responsive to the needs of their people. So this is, in my view, uh, we need to do two things. One, uh, we need to raise awareness that this is important. Otherwise, we will be seeing military coups happening every, every, every now and then. So we need to attend to the needs of our people. Number two, we need to create systems of governance that are responsive, really, really responsive. Number three, we need to communicate better. Uh, sometimes there are many things that our governments do that we're not even aware of. There are many programs that, that, that are there that people are not aware of. So I think those are some of the three things that I, that I can talk about. Uh, uh, systems of governance, raising awareness about the issues, uh, you know, people being able to feel that, you know, that they have people who are in office who are looking after their own interests. Thank you. Very good. Thank you so much. It, it was actually straightforward and uh, understandable. Okay. Uh, the next question is saying, what is the best measure for inclusiveness for governments? How do we ration out so that each age and gender is well represented? So, uh, this question is uh, asked by Lintel. Yes, oh, Al, that's, that's a very good question. And, and, and you remember what I was saying that, uh, uh, you know, those in office often think they're being inclusive, but when you ask those who are outside of office, they'll tell you you're not being inclusive. I think the most important thing is to have some sort of watchdog that really constantly, is constantly making sure that 
these things are, are you know, that, the, that, the, that these things are, are, are happening, that the country is being as inclusive as it can. Because sometimes there is also a violation of the laws of the country. Uh, I'm often, uh, let, let's look at the issue of gender, for example. You know, they say in some constitutions, 30% of the government should be women. Actually, in many countries, what they say is that 30% is a minimum, but you can go higher than 30%. So you've had some countries which have had 50-50. I think that when you have watchdogs which are constantly monitoring these things, uh, holding to account the leadership, uh, then you can you can succeed in achieving some level of inclusiveness and, and equity. But you need mechanism to constantly look into that. Now, being just there, just talking about inclusivity without uh, measuring it with or monitoring it uh, is not helpful. And those who have succeeded are, often have good mechanism to uh, to measure whether they're doing the right thing or not. I understand that. Thank you so much sir, for, for, for the answer. I'm going to ask this question to Kemal Abdullah if he's uh, around, if he's with us. Can you he hear us, Mr. Kemal? I think he's not on. Just continue with that. I, I, don't, oh. I don't think he's around, so we can shift to ambassador, but uh, we have asking many questions for ambassador. Sorry for okay. those. Uh, you can. It's all right. I'm enjoying this. <laughs> <laughs> okay, very good. So the next question um, says that, would you agree with the notion that the digestibility of legislation and how government information such as gazettes get dispersed into the public is somehow difficult for the public to understand and interact with? Oh, this is an issue of communication, I think. Uh... Yeah that uh, governments need to uh, sort out. But I, I think that we, you know, local leaders also have a role to play. Local leaders, uh, the, you know, those who interact with the communities, they have a, they have a role to play to, uh, you know, to explain these gazettes and, uh, and other uh, communication that is happening. And, and I think that's why, um, you know, leadership, uh, we often look at ministers and uh, presidents, but, but we don't often look at the, the you know, the mayors and, uh, uh, administrators, they, they have an important role to play. And by the way, many of the violations and all the problems that happen, it happens at the level of, of the administrator, not even at the level of governors. It's really at that local level. And I think that uh, even the issues of communication can find an answer uh, if, if people work very closely with, uh, you know, at that level as well. Very good. Thank you so much. I think that's the last question. All the other questions are somehow related to each other. You've already answered the question. Really? Um, I can't thank you enough. I've learned a lot of things from this, uh, really, from this uh, webinar. Thank you so much. And uh, uh, let me give the floor to our founder and president to, you know, say his final words. Um, I can't say many words because all the words ambassador said it. And they were very clear, articulate, and very basic for anyone to understand, really. And I just want to touch about corruption because corruption has been Africanized in a way. Now, in the West, I live in Canada. I am Canadian, North American, Western. Here in the West, corruption is legal. And I'll tell you how it is legal. They have what they call lobby groups, you know, special interest groups. Now, what they do is purely corruption. If you are trusting a leader and you are democratic enough, why do you have to buy me lunch? Why do companies spend millions of money if it is a transparent system in the, and, and uh, a fair, as they say? So corruption here is legalized. And there are special interest groups, lobby groups. Their job is to lobby. Their companies, uh, there is no elected leader in the West without the interest and the money of, of companies. That is pure corruption. Now, what happens in Africa is we pretend not to be corrupt. It's just their stealing. If you have a contract, and a, a budget to a, like $50 million and you take and you take 50, I mean, you take 20, that's not true, corruption. that is robbery. So corruption is a kind of mechanism that moves societies. The point is, do we do all that for the interest of our people or for the interest of our economies? So it's not really an, a corrupt, the, the, even what they call corruption. Actually, those even, they crucify African leaders or what. 
they are victims of corruption, of illicit transfers of money by the Western companies and, 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 uh, and, and uh, special interest groups. So corruption, you, you have really to enlighten more and uh, go beyond what they tell you in the media. Because uh, if I, we, I have a friend who was doing some business projects with the government, I won't mention. So the deal was $5.4 billion. And they, of course, there is corruption inside them. But the minister who was accused of corruption took $200,000. Now, is that really corruption? And now the media is going to rush at him. He's so corrupt. He's, man, out of four, if you take $200 billion, even if you're a baby, you say no. So sometimes we have to really suffer the, the geopolitical influence of these multinational companies and structures. But I don't say there is no corruption. Absolutely, there is corruption. But it's not an African issue. It's a really global issue. And sooner people see that uh, to taint a picture like African, like Ambassador was saying, is to taint, uh, to prevent and tear a false narrative that goes beyond even to affect our investment. So I want to tell you that corruption is not real African. The only difference in the West, it is legalized and the people are allowed to do corruption wherever we are. And uh, in some cases, they even call it appreciation. No, it's not corruption, it's appreciation. So it's just playing with words. I wish Africans also invent their word, you know? Yeah, so otherwise, I, I would like Ambassador uh, Fred to say his final word, his magic message to our young people as we close, yeah. Thank you so much. Uh, this is so well said. I was just enjoying what you're saying about corruption. Now, the only thing I would like to tell you is you playing small does not help us. I think it's Nelson Mandela who has who said it. Be ambitious, dream big, uh, you know, get involved, run for office. You know, there is not a single one of you who cannot have, make an impact. There's not a single one of you that is small. I, I, I really challenge you to really believe in yourselves and you will have people who try to hold you back because that's, that's the nature of the, of the game. But don't listen to them. Just fight for what you believe is right. Last but not least is have ideological clarity. And I think these are the conversations that we need to be having, uh, especially this generation, about what is it that we want as Africans, regardless of what others want from us. You know, what is it that we want? And so these are some of the final words that I would like to um, leave you with and also tell you that uh, you know, let's continue having these conversations. There is a lot that you can learn. We didn't talk about our work that we do on a daily basis, but there is a lot that we're doing also on a daily basis, which might be of interest to you. And I can assure you that, uh, you know, let's stay in touch. For me, every time that I have an opportunity to uplift one of you or to give them an opportunity, I, I, I will assure you that I will work on it as much as I can. And so, and on that note, I'm very proud to see my flag actually in the background, the flag of my country. So yeah. I want to say thank you for that. Yeah. And then uh, wish you all a happy weekend. Thank you so yeah, much. Thank you so much, Ambassador uh, Fred, uh, for the wonderful and the wise uh, charisma. I like the passion, like the, the vibe, it's really enlightening. So Dawit, who, uh, Dawit is our international partnership advisor. He's based in Ethiopia. So he's already looking for us in the continent, the best brains around. And your name came first. Derek, would you like to say something? Yeah, uh, thank you so much, every one of you, uh, uh, particularly uh, our panelists. Uh, so as I said before, when we see the map of Africa, it looks like, it, it looks like a question mark because Africa has a, a question of uh, unemployment, it's, it's, uh, it's a civil war, corruption, and unconstitutional changes of government. So we are the one who can make or break Africa. We are also the solution for our mother Africa. So we have to uh, uh, remember or commemorate um, our Pan-Africanist uh, fathers. So please, please, young people, it is, we are the one who can make or break Africa. Let's stand together for uh, the realization of Agenda 2063. Uh, in addition, from the bottom of my heart, I would like to thank uh, Mr. Kamal and Ambassador Fred. Uh, it was really, uh, really, really uh, fruitful discussion. And it was all, uh, Ambassador gave us like uh, well informative information on uh, the whole things. So 
I uh, keep in touch with ambassadors and ambassador uh, will work with us, particularly with Africa rivers. So thank you, uh, everyone of, uh, including Eno. Uh, thank you so much, everyone, the participants. So in the next week also, we will have uh, an extraordinary justice. So thank you, uh, young generation of Africa. Thank you. I, I like the audio that says from the bottom of his heart. <laughs> Why can't he begin from the top and the bottom? <laughs> So thank you so much, Dawit, uh, for the great work you're doing down in Ethiopia. And uh, everyone, thank you, everyone. Thank you, Osman, for the wonderful moderation and everyone who attended. Like African Rebirth Wars say that we defy mediocrity. I think we nailed it that uh, we need to believe in ourselves and all the guests coined on it. We need to believe in ourselves and do better and dream big, you know, the, the inherent uh, belief. It is the only investment that you cannot ask for an external help, belief in yourself. So you don't need aid, you don't need money, you don't need to beg for investors, you don't need, just look into yourself. And that's where the, the stunning revolution begins to thrive. So thank you very much. As I already said that Africa it, it, uh, belongs to you and we, it starts with you, it ends with you. So it's us to make it greater. So thank you very much. Have a wonderful weekend, everyone. Thank you, too, and have a 